Let's talk about directional derivatives and the gradient. This is good stuff where we break out of uh, kind of a trap we've gotten ourselves into of thinking of the coordinate directions as special. So we've got a function f which goes from two variables to one so we could think of it that as given by its graph z equals f of x y so for example this is a picture we could have um, or of course we could also be looking at the level curves and that's a very very useful thing to do especially when we're thinking about um, these issues of directional derivatives and gradients because this gets us into just the plane and doesn't make us think that it has to be in three-dimensional space. A lot of the time this is a better picture. But to know both of them is really great. Okay, So here's the deal. We have um, the partial derivative. Well, let me put that, let me display that. The partial derivative of z with respect to x and the partial derivative of z with respect to y. And these are really directional derivatives in, them, in themselves. dz dx means if I'm at a particular point, uh, let's go to show partial derivatives. If I'm at like this pink point, we know that the partial derivative with respect to x means look at this line in the contour plot, or equivalently, look at the yellow line here where x is variable and y is constant, and look at the slope of that. That's the, the red line here. We're familiar with that at this point. And the d by dx is, says just go in this direction, take a slice in this blue direction here, look at the slope of the blue curve, which is the green line. But what's so special about these coordinate directions? Why can't I just go in any direction and look at the, the slope there? Well, if our formula is given in terms of x and y, like here it's got this formula, the big complicated polynomial formula to create this funky function, then it's true that it's easier to calculate partial derivatives. You just pretend you're in BC calc and you just set x constant or y constant. But we should be able to go in another direction. Okay, So that's what directional derivatives are about. So here um, we're at this same point. The pink point is the same. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this slider and this changes that slice to be rotating around. So you can see it rotating around here. And so we can go in any direction. We'll get a certain kind of slice, like this one, for example, pointing basically up the hill. And we can look at the derivative of that, uh, that function. Okay. So the question is, how do we calculate that? How do we make that algebraic? And does it have some relationship to the partial derivatives? And the answer is, of course, yes. Okay. So here's the way I like to say it, is we train a bug to walk from, uh, let's say, the pink point in the direction of the desired slice. Okay, And we might as well have it do uh, train the bug in as simple a way as possible. Let's say, uh, in a straight line with constant velocity. Okay Then what would that have to do with the directional derivative? Okay. Oh, and constant velocity. Um, let's say unit velocity. Unit velocity. So he's going one uh, unit of distance for every unit of time. Okay. So the directional derivative then at this point in this direction. So notice there's going to be two inputs to the directional derivative. You have to say what point and what direction. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask the bug as he starts here and as he's go setting off along this, this direction at unit speed, I'm just going to ask how fast is his temperature changing. So like here, the bug is, like, since we, here we could think of it as like a height. Okay, Here I'm thinking of it as a temperature. We could think of it as a height of a, of a landscape as well. We let the bug look, be here on the landscape. We say go in this direction and tell me how fast your height is changing or if the function is temperature or whatever the function is. We ask how fast. Ask the bug how fast is that output of that function changing? So it's the uh, rate of change of of z, the output of the function, and we could just call that z. Oops, z equals f of x y, according to the bug. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly something we've done, and we use the chain. We can use the chain rule for that. Okay. So what we've got is that uh, z equals f now of x of t comma y of t. That's the chain rule situation. So we know what the chain rule says. It says that dz dt, that's going to be our directional derivative, is 
partial z, partial x, oops, times dx dt plus partial z, partial y, times dy dt. Okay? Now, dx dt and dy dt, ooh, hey, wait a minute. That's exactly the components of the velocity vector of the bug. Okay? So that's interesting. It's going to be like a dot product. Okay? And there's other ways to interpret it. It's more sophisticated to think of it as a matrix product, but we're going to also be able to think of it as a dot product. So let's just set this up. The thing we need to do is train the bug. Okay? I need to give you a particular um, vector that it represents this yellow arrow. Okay? So we want the directional derivative of f at, let's say, x naught, y naught, that's our specific point, in the direction of the vector u. And let's say that's equal to a comma b. And it's a vector, so I'll make it both face. Okay? And usually, it's not really that crucial. Um, and the book always does this. We set, we make sure that u is a unit vector. Okay? The reason for that is we're going to use this as the bug's velocity. And if the bug is going super fast, we would get an inaccurate impression of how fast this function is changing. If I set the bug off and the bug is really, really fast going up this hill, it's going to say, wow, this is a really steep hill. It's going to say my height is changing really fast. But it's not necessarily that steep. It's just because the bug is climbing very fast. Okay? So this is to the unit vector prescriptions to make sure that that's not an issue. Okay. So what's a function that would, that would do that? We want x of t, y of t, the bug's position, Okay, well, we just start at x naught, y naught. Okay, plus t times ab. Okay, and so what's dx dt? It's nothing but a. And dx dy dt is nothing but b. Okay, so the chain rule then gives us that dz dt, how fast the, the, the function is changing according to the bug, is just dz dx times a plus dz dy times b. Okay, and that's something we could write in a couple of different ways. We could take this and make it into a vector and then say it's the dot product of that with the chosen vector a, b. Okay, that's going to be really useful. Another way to do it is that I like to emphasize in our class is that we could think of this as a matrix. Let's put this in. We've talked briefly. Oh, goodness. That's not what I wanted. That's weird. Okay, that's really weird. Okay. We could put this into a 1 by 2 matrix. And then it's just the matrix product of that with a, b as a column vector. So let me put that in as a column vector. That's just a matrix product. And I claim that's really a more natural way to think about it. But the book talks about it this way, and most, say, let's say, engineers talk about it this way, as the dot product of a vector created out of the, uh, the partials with the vector that you chose for the, the direction of the, um, the directional derivative. Okay, so let me just expound on that a little bit. There's a name for this, which is very famous. It's called the gradient. Where's my? This is the gradient of f, and then you dot it with the vector that you've chosen, a, b. Now, to be more explicit, we need to remind ourselves, hey, we need to actually evaluate those partial derivatives. These guys are going to be functions. They're going to be formulas with x's and y's, and I need to remind myself to evaluate it at the right point. Okay, so this... All this stuff about training the bug and everything is not something we always have to do. That's just to get this one-time answer to say, okay, if we already know the partial derivatives, it's a wonderful fact that you get all of these different directional derivatives by just taking those two numbers in either this form or this form, or in other words, create this gradient vector, and then combine it with the AB that you want for the partial derivative, or for the directional derivative. There's a more we can say about the gradient, but that's 
um, all I need to say about it right now, except just let's do an explicit example. Okay, let's say f of x, y is, let's have something really simple. Let's say x squared plus 2y squared. Okay, and so I'll put that in here. Something real simple, x squared plus 2 times y squared. Okay, and let's see if we can have more of a plot. Okay, it's just a bowl. It's an elliptical bowl, basically. Okay, so now let's go back to the directional derivative plot. Okay, so here I am, maybe at this point, I can move it around. Okay, let's say we're at 1 comma 1. Okay, and I want to know the directional derivative, let's say, in the direction that goes equally to the left and up. Okay, so I've got our function. Here's the three ingredients. x naught, y naught is 1 comma 1. And my AB, now this is where we have to be a little careful. I want it in the direction that's going equally left and up, but, but minus 1, 1, for example, would not work. It's not a unit factor. And again, there's situations in which that's totally okay, but usually you want to just divide that by its length, and that's root 2. Okay. So now there's our ingredients. What do we need to do? We just need to calculate the partials, or in other words, the gradient that combines the partials together into a vector. Okay, that's 2x comma 4y, but it's evaluated at 1, 1, so it's going to be 2 comma 4. And then we just, the directional derivative. Oh yeah, and I still haven't given you a notation of the directional derivative. So the directional derivative notation is, here's our vector u. Oh, and let me put it in here as well. Okay. Of f at 1, 1. Lots of stuff here, and that's in, but it's because there really are three ingredients. There's the function, there's the direction, there's the location. And that's just going to be a very easy calculation. The upshot of it is that there's really, it's really not that hard. That's a minus 1 over root 2, and that's a 1 over root 2. And what do we get? We get 4 minus 2 all over root 2, 2 over root 2, but that rationalizes very nicely down to just root 2. Okay, so what does that say? It says that if I start here and I go in this direction, it, for every one unit of distance that I travel, the function should go up by root 2. In particular, it's positive. Let's see if that makes sense. Well, notice these contours. If you look at this, um, the 3D graph, we can see that these contours go from small to big as you go out. And indeed, if I start here and I go in this direction, I'm going from, from a certain contour to bigger and bigger and bigger values. And it's doing this that it's starting here and going upward sloping. It's a little harder to tell in the 3D graph, um, but it really is going up as I go out. And so the fact that this is positive, is, it's a good check that that's making sense. Okay, um, That's a good place to stop this one.